They married in 1952. Julia got her PhD and settled down to what would turn out to be her lifetime's work, Hilbert's tenth problem. She thought about it all the time. She said to me she just wouldn't want to die without knowing that answer. And it, ha it had become an obsession. Julia's obsession has been shared with many other mathematicians since Hilbert had first posed it back in 1900. His tenth problem asked if there was some universal method that could tell whether any equation had whole number solutions or not. Nobody had been able to solve it. In fact, the growing belief was that no such universal method was possible. How on earth could you prove that however ingenious you were, you'd never come up with a method. With the help of colleagues, Julia developed what became known as the Robinson Hypothesis. This argued that to show that no such method existed, all you had to do was to cook up one equation whose solutions were a very specific set of numbers. The set of numbers needed to grow exponentially, like taking powers of two, yet still be captured by the equations at the heart of Hilbert's problem. Try as she might, Robinson just couldn't find this set. For the tenth problem to be finally solved, there needed to be some fresh inspiration. And that came from 5,000 miles away, St. Petersburg in Russia. Ever since the great Leonard Euler set up shop here in the 18th century, the city has been famous for its mathematics and mathematicians. Here in the Steklov Institute, some of the world's brightest mathematicians have set out their theorems and conjectures. This morning, one of them is giving a rare seminar. It's tough going, even if you speak Russian, which unfortunately I don't. But we get a break in the middle to recover before the final hour. There's a kind of rule in seminars that uh, the first third is for everyone, the second third is for the experts, and the last third is just for the lecturer. So I think that's what we're going to get next. The lecturer is Yuri Matyasevich, and he's explaining his latest work on, what else? The Riemann Hypothesis. As a bright young graduate student in 1965, Yuri's tutor suggested he have a go at another Hilbert problem, the one that had in fact preoccupied Julia Robinson, Hilbert's tenth. It was the height of the Cold War. Perhaps Matyasevich could succeed for Russia, where Julia and her fellow American mathematicians had failed. At first I did not like the approach. All right. Uh, the statement looked to me rather strange, artificial, but after some time I understood that it is quite natural and then I understood that we had a new brilliant idea and I just started to further develop in it. And in January 1970, he found the vital last piece in the jigsaw. He saw how to capture the famous Fibonacci sequence of numbers using the equations that were at the heart of Hilbert's problem. Building on the work of Julia and her colleagues, he'd solved the tenth. He was just 22 years old. The first person he wanted to tell was the woman he owed so much to. And uh, I got no answer. Huh. And I believed they, they were lost in the mail. It was quite natural uh, because it was Soviet time. But back in California, Julia had heard rumours through the mathematical grapevine that the problem had been solved and she contacted Yuri herself. She said, I uh, just had to wait for you to grow up to get the answer, because she had started work in 1948. Even. When Yuri was just a baby. And then he responds by thanking her and saying that the credit is as much hers as it is his. I met Julia one year later, it was in Bucharest, and I suggested that after the Congress in Bucharest, Julia and her husband, Raphael, came to see me here in Leningrad. Together, Julia and Yuri worked on several other mathematical problems until shortly before Julia died in 1985. She was just 55 years old. She was able to find uh, new ways. Many mathematicians just uh, combined previously known methods to solve new problems, and she had really new ideas. 
Although Julia Robinson showed that there was no universal method to solve all equations in whole numbers, mathematicians were still interested in finding methods to solve special classes of equations. It would be in France in the early 19th century, in one of the most extraordinary stories in the history of mathematics, that methods were developed to understand why certain equations could be solved while others couldn't. It's early morning in Paris on the 29th of May, 1832. Every Scalois is about to fight for his very life. It's the reign of the reactionary Bourbon king, Charles X. And Galois, like many angry young men in Paris then, is a republican revolutionary. Unlike the rest of his comrades, though, he has another passion, mathematics. He'd just spent four months in jail. Then, in a mysterious saga of unrequited love, he's challenged to a duel. He'd been up the whole previous night, refining a new language for mathematics he'd developed. Galois believed that mathematics shouldn't be the study of number and shape, but the study of structure. Perhaps he was still preoccupied with his maths. There was only one shot fired that morning. Galois died the next day, just 20 years old. It was one of mathematics' greatest losses. Only by the beginning of the 20th century would Galois be fully appreciated and his ideas fully realised. Galois had discovered new techniques to be able to tell whether certain equations could have solutions or not. The symmetry of certain geometric objects seemed to be the key. His idea of using geometry to analyse equations will be picked up in the 1920s by another Parisian mathematician, André Vey. I was very much interested and uh, so far as school was concerned quite successful in all possible branches. And he was. After studying in Germany as well as France, André settled down at this apartment in Paris, which he shared with his more famous sister, the writer Simon Weil. But when the Second World War broke out, he found himself in very different circumstances. He dodged the draft by fleeing to Finland, where he was almost executed for being a Russian spy. On his return to France, he was put in prison in Rouen to await trial for desertion. At the trial, the judge gave him a choice. Five more years in prison or serve in a combat unit. He chose to join the French army. A lucky choice, because just before the Germans invaded a few months later, all the prisoners were killed. They only spent a few months in prison. But this time was crucial for his mathematics. Because here he built on the ideas of Galois and first developed algebraic geometry a whole new language for understanding solutions to equations. Galois had shown how new mathematical structures could be used to reveal the secrets behind equations. Vey's work led him to theorems that connected number theory, algebra, geometry and topology and are one of the greatest achievements of modern mathematics. And without André Vey, we would never have heard of the strangest man in the history of maths. Nicholas Bourbaki. There are no photos of Bourbaki in existence, but we do know that he was born in this cafe in the Latin Quarter in 1934, when it was a proper cafe, the Cafe Coupillard, and not the fast food joint it's now become. Just down the road, I met up with Bourbaki expert David Orban. I must say, actually, when I was a graduate student, I got quite frightened when I used to go into the library because this guy, Bourbaki, had had written so many books. Something like 30 or 40 altogether. In analysis, in geometry, in topology, it was all new foundation. Virtually everyone studying math seriously anywhere in the world in the 1950s, 60s and 70s would have read Nicholas Bourbaki. And he also applied for membership of the American Math Society, I heard. But At I th- which point he was, de- he was denied membership. Really? Be, uh, on the ground that he didn't exist. Oh, The Americans were right. Nicholas Bourbaki does not exist at all, and never has. Bourbaki is in fact the nom de plume for a group of French mathematicians led by André Vey, who decided to write a coherent account of the mathematics of the 20th century. 
most of the time, mathematicians like to have their own names on theorems. But for the Babaki group, the aims of the project overrode any desire for personal glory. After the Second World War, the Bulbaki baton was handed down to the next generation of French mathematicians. And their most brilliant member was Alexander Grothendieck. Here at the IHES in Paris, the French equivalent of Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, Grothendieck held court at his famous seminars in the 1950s and 1960s. He had this incredible charisma and um, he had this amazing ability to see a young person and somehow know what kind of contribution this person can make to this incredible vision he had of, of how mathematics, so to speak, could be. And this vision enabled him to get across some very difficult ideas indeed. He says, suppose you want to open a walnut. So the standard thing is you take a nutcracker and you just break it open. And he says, his approach is more like you take this walnut and you put it out in the snow and you leave it there for a few months and then when you come back to it, it just opens. Grothendieck is a structuralist. What he's interested in are the hidden structures underneath all mathematics. Only when you get down to the very basic architecture and think in very general terms will the patterns in mathematics become clear. Grothendieck produced a new powerful language to see structures in a new way. It was like living in a world of black and white and suddenly having the language to see the world in colour. And it's a language that mathematicians have been using ever since to solve problems in number theory, geometry, even fundamental physics. But in the late 1960s, Grothendieck decided to turn his back on mathematics after he discovered politics. He believed that the threat of nuclear war and the questions of, of uh, nuclear disarmament were more important than mathematics. Huh. And that people who continued to do mathematics rather than confront this threat of nuclear war were doing harm in the world. Grothendieck decided to leave Paris and move back to the south of France where he grew up. Bursts of radical politics followed, and then a nervous breakdown. He moved to the Pyrenees and became a recluse. He's now lost all contact with his old friends and mathematical colleagues. Nevertheless, the legacy of his achievements means that Grothendieck stands alongside Cantor, Gödel and Hilbert as somebody who has transformed the mathematical landscape. He changed the whole subject in, in a really fundamental way. I mean, it'll, it'll never go back. Certainly he's, he's the dominant figure of the 20th century. I've come back to England, though, thinking again about another seminal figure of the 20th century. The person that started it all off, David Hilbert. Of the 23 problems that Hilbert set mathematicians in the year 1900, most of them now have been solved. However, there is one great exception, the Riemann hypothesis, the eighth on Hilbert's list. That one is still the holy grail of mathematics. Hilbert's lecture inspired a generation to pursue their mathematical dreams. This morning, in the town where I grew up, I hope to inspire another generation. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello, my name's Marcus de Sotoy, and I'm a professor of mathematics up the road at the University of Oxford. Um, but it was actually in this school here, in fact, this classroom, is where I discovered my love for mathematics. And this love of mathematics that I first acquired here in my old comprehensive school still drives me now. It's a love of solving problems. There are so many problems I could tell them about, but I've chosen my favourite. I think that a mathematician is a pattern searcher. And that's really what mathematicians try and do. We try and understand sort of the patterns and the structure and the logic to explain the way the world around us works. And this is really at the heart of the Riemann hypothesis. The task is, is there any pattern in these numbers which can help me to say where the next number is going to be? What's the next one after 31? How can I tell? 
These numbers are, of course, prime numbers, the building blocks of mathematics. The Riemann hypothesis, a conjecture about the distribution of the primes, goes to the very heart of our subject. Why on earth is anybody interested in these primes? Why is the army interested in primes? Why are spies interested in primes? It's needed to encrypt stuff. Exactly. I study this stuff because I think it's all really beautiful and, and, and elegant, but actually... There's a lot of people who are interested in these numbers because they're very practical use. The bizarre thing is that the more abstract and difficult mathematics becomes, the more it seems to have applications in the real world. Mathematics now pervades every aspect of our lives. Every time we switch on the television, plug in a computer, pay with a credit card, there's now a million dollars for anybody who can solve the Riemann hypothesis. But there's more at stake than that. Anybody who proves this theorem will be remembered forever. They'll be up on that board ahead of any of those other mathematicians. And that's because the Riemann hypothesis is a cornerstone of maths. Thousands of theorems depend on it being true. Very few mathematicians think that it isn't true. But mathematics is about proof. And until we can prove it, there will still be doubt. Maths has grown out of this passion to get rid of doubt. This is what I've learned in my journey through the history of mathematics. Mathematicians like Archimedes and al Khwarizmi, Gauss and Grothendieck were driven to understand the precise way numbers and space work. Maths in action, that one. It's beautiful. It's really nice, yeah. Using the language of mathematics, they've told us stories that remain as true today as they were when they were first told. In the Mediterranean, I discovered the origins of geometry. Mathematicians and philosophers flocked to Alexandria, driven by their thirst for knowledge and the pursuit of excellence. In India, I learned about another discovery that it'd be impossible to imagine modern life without. So here we are, in one of the true holy sites of the mathematical world. Up here are some numbers, and here's a new number. It's zero. In the Middle East, I was amazed at al Khwarizmi's invention of algebra. He developed systematic ways to be able to analyse problems so that the solutions would work, whatever the numbers that you took. In the golden age of mathematics, in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, I found how maths discovered new ways for analysing bodies in motion, and new geometries that helped us to understand the very strange shape of space. It is with Riemann's work that we finally have the mathematical glasses to be able to explore such worlds of the mind. And now my journey into the abstract world of 20th century mathematics has revealed that maths is the true language the universe is written in, the key to understanding the world around us. Mathematicians aren't motivated by money and material gain, or even by practical applications of their work. For us, it's the glory of solving one of the great unsolved problems that have outwitted previous generations of mathematicians. Hilbert was right. It's the unsolved problems of mathematics which make it a living subject, which obsess each new generation of mathematicians. Despite all the things we've discovered over the last seven millennia, there are still many things we don't understand. And it's Hilbert's call of we must know, we will know, which drives mathematics. You can learn more about the story of maths with the Open University at open2.net. Stay with us, there's more to tease your grey matter coming up next tonight here on BBC4 with Only Connect.